Thank you very much. My name is Vida Farid Hassan. I'm from Salamosh University. Um, I am going to take a few minutes just maybe to introduce myself because it is sometimes difficult to explain to people exactly what I do. Um, I used to be a journalist. Um, I then lectured in journalism for a long, long time where I became very interested in the role of the media in society, mass communication theory, media, sociology and things like that. So uh, I want to understand the role of the media in society. And then after that, I became involved in writing about science, first for the CSIR in Victoria, and now for the Faculty of Science here at Southern Bosch University. So at the moment, I'm a little bit of everything, and I'm all over the place, and I'm enjoying it tremendously. Um, it is a little bit like acting research for a social scientist, to, and specifically a journalist, to venture out in this field of science every day and talking to these people. So my first question today is, in this audience, how many journalists do we have here in this audience today? Ooh, we are few and far between. Hardcore scientists. Okay. Oh, we are. Okay, so this section we have to attend. And then lawyers, philosophers, social scientists. Okay, there should have been more. There should have been more. Yes. Okay. So. Just in terms of logistics, um, we are going to have a break between the two sessions, so I'm going to explain a little bit about my world, then Elspie Briss from Die Burger, or uh, Die Burger, the Media Film Tone, have you done that? Sorry, we'll do your thing. And we will have a short coffee break after that, about 3 o'clock, and then Mia Milan and George Parson will do their thing. So this afternoon, it's a session of journalists only, and uh, we're looking forward to this. Okay, so the title of our panel discussion this afternoon, The Media and Pseudoscience, which already in the same sentence makes me a little bit uncomfortable, Reflecting Science Through a Dirty Mirror. Now, I'm going to start this session, and it was quite interesting to me this morning that uh, there was a referral to the War of the Worlds and that of Orson Welles. And many times when I lecture about mass communication and mass communication theory and the role of the media in society, um, the central question is, how powerful is the media? And when we use this example, people think, wow, in, when, with the advent of radio, people thought the media was all-powerful. All of a sudden, we had the ability to talk to thousands, millions of people one message and everybody will hear that single message at the, exactly the same time. So people and scientists, researchers thought it was immensely powerful. And I'm going to play you just a small clip from the War of the World. Let's see if this works. Well, there are no human hands left to wind the clock. <laughs> Orson Welles, writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history. And radio broadcasts provoked such outrage or such chaos. Upwards of a million people convinced, if only briefly, that the United States was being laid waste. Orange, not too spoiled to swallow. Orson Welles, War of the Worlds. Time to time, I can say that radio broadcasts provoked such outrage or such chaos. Upwards of a million people convinced, if only briefly, that the United States was being laid waste by alien invaders, and a nation left to wonder how they possibly could have been so gullible. Brilliantly directed by Wells, the War of the Worlds would become in the end the most famous radio program in history, known forever after as the Panic Broadcast. Yet it all began unremarkably, at a little past 8 o'clock in the East, a Sunday evening like any other in America, with dinners being finished, dishes washed, and radios across the country turned on, more or less in unison. In a the broadcasting system at station will present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the World by H.G. West. It was October 30th, the eve of Halloween, a night known variously as Mischief Night, Devil's Night, Hell 
all night. A night that for some 200 years had unleashed all manner of trickery on the unsuspecting. On this night, in 1938, it would also unleash the pent-up anxieties of a nation. I'm just going to stop there. It's worthwhile to watch the entire um, documentary. So, what did happen later, um, with hindsight, um, there was some research done on this whole phenomenon. And it was found that there were actually very few people who listened to War of the Worlds that evening. And that, as a matter of fact, the um, reaction of the newspaper, newspaper or print media was in reaction to this power of radio, the seemingly power of radio, and that the newspaper industry was actually feeling threatened. And so they blew up this whole idea that radio is irresponsible, it can be used as a propaganda medium to influence people, to do wrong things. Um, so when we look at hindsight and we think about how we're going on now about what Twitter is doing and what the social media is doing, how it is eroding um, established media, isn't it a little bit, we have to ask the question, isn't it a little bit of the same that we are experiencing here? So, from my field of my mass communication research and mass communication theory, um, it is always been said that mass communication became a field of study the moment it became a problem. So, communication has been around forever, and okay, we have psychology, we have philosophy and those things, but mass communication as a subject taught at university, that is something else. And I want to venture and go further and say now this whole new field of science communication that is developing at the moment is that not also because science or science communication is in trouble. And that is why we have to look at it. One of my big frustrations as a journalist and working in the lecturing to mass communication theory was that this it's not giving me any answers. Um, I had the opportunity last year again here to help out at the journalism department um, to teach media and society mass communication theory. And I was like, after writing for five or six years about science, I had to go back to the uh, science, I had to go back to the social sciences again. And I was again confronted with the idea that journalists were not interested in these mass communication theories. They want to become journalists, they want to tell the stories, they want to expose corruption. They want to be the watchdogs. This thing about the role of the media and society for most of them was the most boring, most difficult, theoretical, far out, you know, what does it mean to real life kind of theory. And um, it frustrated me as well because I was asking the same questions. So let's just park that 50 years of communication research has shown that the, the media has minimal to really significant effect depending on how you look at it. So, another concept I want to put out there is this whole idea of the media reflecting science through a dirty mirror. And I've specifically taken the media and pseudoscience combination away. So, what does this mean? The whole idea of the media as the dirty mirror comes from um, Bukhi, Bukhi, I'm not sure about the pronunciation there, the whole diffusionist conception, so that science is taking place in a certain place and, and arena, and then it gets translated, diffused through the media, so that eventually it can get to the general public. But in this process, um, this media mirror is not very, is very dirty, it's unable adequately to reflect and filter scientific facts. And maybe a few of you are saying, yes, that's exactly what it is. But at the same time, there are some assumptions in this approach to the media as a dirty mirror. Um, on the one hand, it legitimizes the social and professional role of mediators, especially science journalists. So there has to be people, there have to be people translating science for the general public. At the same time, it exonerates scientists. So they can sit back and say, and criticize, and say, oh, they're the media again. You know, they don't, they don't understand the public. Oh, they don't know the difference between causation and correlation and things like that. So there's this distance. And while I was busy with this presentation, I landed upon a nature special 
edition in 2009, which coincided with, uh, I think, the World Federation of Science Journalists Conference. And the question nature was asking, science journalism facing a, a certain future, but should scientists care? And um, yeah, the scientist hero, media glorifying him, a uh, very disturbing image, that one. So, um, the next two slides pretty much have been spoken about today. Uh, we are not living, we're living in a completely new world. We're talking about science communication 2.0. Um, there is no gatekeepers anymore. Everything is fluid. Scientists can communicate. They can Twitter. Sometimes journalists are still journalists are sometimes complaining about scientists at conferences, uh, blogging about stuff, while the journalists still had to adhere to certain rules and say, I can only communicate about this after that and things like that. So they are still being constrained by rules. And then, of course, what we've spoken about a lot this, after, oh, this morning already, this opening the scientific debate, quasi quasi experts, amateurs, citizen scientists. Um, we've also seen this decline in science's cultural authority. Um, we've been making a lot of promises in science. So why are things still going wrong in society? There's a lot of things going right, okay, please. <laughs> So when we talk about and that about this thing about being a journalist and being writing about science and the dirty mirror concept and you are this journalist at the interface between society where you work with people every day. Elsa B always tells me, okay, no, please me. Sunny, Sunny, she has to understand this. Go back and we have to make Sunny Sunny understand what this is all about. So she does that to me to my great frustration, and then sometimes I say, oh, damn, Danny Sunny, you know. <laughs> I just, this is a good story, we need to get it out. So, so journalists find them at this interface between the general public, and we are accountable to the general public, and we're the watchdogs for society. But at the same time, you are working with wonderful people, science, science is amazing, and you want to tell those stories, and the benefits, and all those things. So how, how do we do this? And in I deliberately put this image up, I don't know if you can see it. Um, it may look like an internet um, network or something like that, but it's actually a spider web. Um, so we are muddling about, there's also this idea of the shattered glass. We, we do not talk, I don't think we can talk anymore about a dirty mirror. This is the kind of thing we're talking about here, where the mirror is not only dirty, but also fractured in a thousand bits. And we have to operate in that kind of society. So, um, I'm dabbling in a whole lot of different fields because that's what I really like. Um, not that I'm an expert, but this is one of the mathematical concepts that has actually made it into the general mind, the butterfly concept. This idea, you don't take it literally. <laughs> um, the whole idea of predictability and how you cannot really predict certain things, that there are certain things that are so difficult to pre predict it is impossible, and that is where chaos theory comes in. Now, some people, fellow scientists, have said that Lorenzo's concept of chaos is similar to scientific revolutions of the quantum theory and uh, quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity. So it's usually, it's I'm putting this one thing out there, and then the next thing, more or less at the same time, written in Weber's Wicked Problems. Now, I first learned about Wicked Problems when I was at the CSIR, writing about environmental problems. And the sustainability scientists would come, and they were so excited about, about this whole idea of Wicked Problems, because they think they can finally um, explain why certain things in society are not working. They've got all these plans, um, environmental impact studies, and they know what should be done, but the moment they enter society, these things don't work. So they develop this concept of wicked problems. And if you go back to the original article, the 1973 article, um, I just love it. They say, it is partly because the classical paradigm of science and engineering the paradigm that has underlain modern professionalism is not applicable to the problems of open societal systems. 
One reason the publics have been attacking the social professions, we believe, is that the cognitive and occupational styles of the profession, mimicking the cognitive style of science and the occupational style of engineering, have just not worked on a wide array of social problems. The lay customers are complaining because planners and other professionals have not succeeded in solving the problems they claimed they could solve. We shall want to suggest that the social professions were misled some way along the line into assuming they could be applied scientists, that they could solve problems in the way scientists can solve their sorts of problems. The error has been a serious one. Social problems are never solved. At best, they are only resolved over and over again. Now, uh, this is also similar time, management thinking. The other one was a political scientist, operational research, people grappling with the issue that the way that we have been working in the society, the way that we have been thinking that society is structured, Linearly, cause and effect, those things are simply not working anymore. Um, back to Stellenbosch University, Rika Preiser, um, from the Center for Co Studies, um, the Center for the Study of Complex Systems in Transition. And I think a few of them are sitting here in the audience today. Um, when I worked with the mass communication students last year, the journalism honors students, towards the end of the year, and after we've worked through all the mass communication theories that we had, that was in the handbook and we, uh, the, the textbook that we had to work through it, I was like, you know, I don't think I've really reached these, we haven't, I haven't got a way of understanding this world yet. And through my work at the Faculty of Science, I then asked Prof. Janne Hofmeyer, I think he was here this morning, to come and lecture and talk to the students about complexity theories and what they are doing at this centre. And Rika Preiser is with them, and for, suddenly, thinking about society and thinking about my role as a journalist and as a communicator in this, in this world, this new world that we have to negotiate, I found answers to how to navigate this world, not in my own discipline, far from it, but from different disciplines, from reading as widely as possible, and being in the fortunate position that I can talk to a wide variety of people, being at a university where you can go and listen to a variety of listeners. And for me as a journalist, and I can put this out to other journalists out there, it felt as for the first time when I look at this approach, it is, doesn't give answers, <laughs> not at all, but it gives you a way maybe of navigating this world that we are in now. Um, there are some people who are trying very hard um, or, and succeeding, Dave Snowden's Cunefin framework. And what is so fascinating about this framework, most of the time, this is not a simple um, four squares. There's a very diff um, definite reason for this thunder thing here. Yeah. Most of the time, we as journalists, and maybe the rest of society as well, are working in this complicated and complex systems. A complicated system, one can still maybe do something with it. It's a like, complicated, like a, a fifth generation jet fight, fighter pilot or something like that. It still has parts that you can break off and try and make sense of it. Complex systems are messy and difficult to navigate and really you just have to, the best term I found for that was that you have to learn to dance with it. There's no one answer. <coughs> Any solution you put can have unintended consequences. Um, you can't control it. You try and you, you just work with it. And then you try your best not to be in chaos. And the worst place you can find yourself is if you operate only in these two paradigms, simple and chaos. The difference is so big, is so large, that this is actually a cliff that you will fall off if you want to move between looking at the world in a very simple way and then being confronted with the chaos that is actually out there. So the ideal is to stay up there and try and navigate the complex and the complicated. Now I've given here a very, very, very simplified version of the complexity um, of the system, but there is way enough information on YouTube to go and look further. There's just one more thing, two more things that I want to put out here. Um, 
social sciences really do need a shake-up. Um, if I cannot, in my own discipline, find answers to how to operate in this world, it is scary. So there are some articles being featured coming up in the social sciences with saying, hey, listen, you know, we've been going around and around and around this topic for many, many years, and there are still so many things that we haven't solved. Um, we have to think differently. We have to do things differently. And that's why there's breaking news. Um, in October this year, there is the historic murder of two councils that for many, many years have been separate. Um, the International Council for Science, which is the Natural Sciences, and then the International Social Science Council. And they have actually merged into the International Science Council with this whole idea of trying to break down the divide. So maybe if we can achieve that in the academic world, if we can achieve that, then maybe we will be able to achieve that in the social world as well. Because the divide is huge. Too huge. Um, then there are thinkers, and again, I'm finding inspiration for how to navigate this world, not in my own discipline, but in vastly different disciplines. Stuart Kaufman's These Two Books, Reinventing the Sacred. It's also a spiderweb, installation of a spiderweb, entangling the universe in a spiderweb is the theme of this and then you have a few children here sitting and trying to see. And if you are, can end off with Kaufman, we latter-day players are heritors of almost four billion years of biological unfolding. If profound participation in such a process is not worthy of awe it, and respect, if it is not sacred, then what might be? So this is a bit of a philosophical, maybe historical, um, introduction to this session. Um, for the rest of the afternoon, we're going to have three, two practicing journalists, and then, of course, and you are all over the place as well, <laughs> talking about how they operate in this world, where they are writing about science, um, especially Mia, health journalism, that is a field where I don't want to go, that is so fraught with problems. <laughs> um, so, for the uh, for the rest of the afternoon, then, um, I'm going to introduce Alcibi, and then we're going to have a quick a coffee break at about 3 o'clock, and then finish the session this afternoon with George and Mia, and then we leave the questions until then. That's fine.